एवरीवन वेलकम टू द चार वक्त पॉडकास्ट दिस इज योर होस्ट कुशल मेहरा टुडेज पॉडकास्ट इज कॉल्ड रिफॉर्मिंग अर्बन इंडिया आई शेयर अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ अ बैकग्राउंड एज टू व्हाई आई डिसाइडेड टू डू दिस पॉडकास्ट वी लिव इन द 21st सेंचुरी एंड द हिस्ट्री ऑफ द ह्यूमन रेस इज ऑल अबाउट लिविंग इन सिटीज स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द इंडस वैली सिविलाइजेशन इन द केस ऑफ दिस लैंडमार्क्स दैट वी आर लिविंग इन uh as per current archaeological records before somebody gets all gram hancocky on me uh just for the record as of now indus valley is the oldest archaeological evidence of urban conglomerates in this landmass to current day and uh, you know cities are just a part of our life and we we don't even realize whether they are good or bad or wh- how important they are and then i i decided let's do a podcast about it and then uh, as always i i tend to go to a few people and then they said ki the best people to talk to are uh, the good folks at arth global that is ruben abraham and pratika hingrani and now i have with me pratika and ruben welcome thank you thank you very much kushal so so maybe we can start over here could you guys tell a little bit about arth global and and for the record uh, uh prithika is the uh, india ceo for arth global and ruben is the global uh, arth global ceo uh, so ruben maybe we can start here please tell everyone what arth global is and then prithika can also jump in and tell us a little bit more yeah so kushal uh, thank you very much for having us on the show um Uh, it's a, it's a great pleasure so um just very quickly so a bunch of us used to be um the team at um idfc institute which was a uh, research think tank that was set up by idfc which is india's largest infrastructure financing company that then went on to uh, spin out a bank that most of you have heard of idfc first bank now um all of our work while we were at idfc institute was focused on india on a certain bunch of issues of which urban was probably one of the most important pillars of the work we had done um and then thanks to a bunch of circumstances including the fact that um idfc was going through a major corporate restructuring um and we had been sort of asking ourselves this question of is the work we have only relevant to india or does it have salience outside of india and uh, we just basically took that opportunity to uh, take the team that was part of idfc institute and start a new organization that would be headquartered in london and we our uh, other big office was in uh, mumbai and so the idea behind it was we have a range of things that we've already done and demonstrated in india we wanted to take it elsewhere that was the idea behind it and uh, i would say that still even today that about 80% of our work is still focused on india but we are hoping that uh, gradually the international portfolio will increase um, as of now we've done work in places as varied as the philippines uh, uh, singapore we've done we've been starting up some work in the in rwanda so it's just sharing of experiences from the indian context elsewhere and then prithika can briefly just talk about what we do in india sure thanks ruben and thanks kushal for having us um and so one of the other things we also did was we took the opportunity to look at the breadth of work that we've done and organize our work into six different centers the largest of which like ruben said is the center on emerging cities so the six pieces of work are a center on cities a center on public health that's very closely allied with what we do on cities so a lot of that right now and the focus of our work in india presently is helping non attainment cities achieve their uh, air pollution targets bringing technical capacity bear, to bear to help them um we've got a center on technology and innovation we have a center on access to justice we're setting up a brand new center called the center for rapid insights um that will work to generate fast frequency data you know in a landscape where you know survey data is obviously hard hard and expensive to collect and then a center on inclusive growth so that's how we've organized our work again largely focused on india but also globally based on what we've done so far all right so we talk about reforming under uh, uh, urban india as the title of the podcast so obviously we're assuming uh, being urban matters and uh, as they say in old adage is that houston we have a problem so we will say mumbai or delhi we have a problem uh, that's why we need to reform it but before that maybe 
uh, we start the premise itself uh, and let me share why i'm bringing this because there's a lot of confusion as to what it means to be urban in india from a definitional perspective now three pieces of research that i came across in in my studies was one is the recent illumination based report by dehija et al where vivek i think it was vivek dehija and them who shared the research looking at the illumination uh, across india and they they said that uh, 60% above i think in the in their research it was either 63% or 67% please don't quote me I, i i have forgotten the exact number that is urban the government of india is on completely another level they have a different uh, criteria they say i think either 33 or 35% of india is only urban then if i remember the gentleman's name correctly it was chinmay tumbe or something of chaitanya tumbe i don't remember the it was something from c that i remember that that research said it was 47 to 48% urban so now where do we begin with over here pritika and ruben both so pritika you can answer first how what percentage of india is urban pehle yahi decide kar le <laughs> that i i you know that that's a very big decision to make um and 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 ruben can get into the details i think at least the premise of our work was to say so look how urban india is depends on what definition we do right and i think that so the official definition uh, actually there are two official definitions there is the statutory definition which is what uh, state governments decide and then there is the and every state uses its own definition and then there's the census definition right which is uniformly applied across the country and that is 31% urban and as we like to say the difference between just those two percentages 25 and 31% is 55 million people right so that's the population of, of South Africa, South Korea has a large population, and the reason that that difference is important is because if you are, if you, when you are classified as urban under the statutory definition, you get uh, an urban local body, you get urban services, fire safety departments, building codes. Um, when you're not classified as such, you are um, essentially governed by rural local bodies that don't have the mandate to provide these basic services, right? Urban services. and so think of it even within the within the bounds of the indian definition you've got 55 million people that live at the density of of, of a city but don't get these services um so so i think our starting point and ruben can illuminate some of what we've done is not that the actual percentage matters but that sort of all other global definitions right so we looked around the world we looked at countries like ghana like mexico venezuela if you use pretty much any other definition india is well over 47% of it so whether it's 50 or 60 doesn't matter it's just that we're much more urban than we think so so uh, kushal um, i think i think it's also interesting to get into the subnational piece of this yeah. so what pritika described was at the national level but it's when you go subnational that the pure absurdity of some of these some of these definitions will start to kick in so she mentioned the difference between statutory and census these are two definitions that the government maintains now let's go subnational let's go to the state of kerala the state of kerala according to statutory definitions is 16% urban according to the census is 48% urban now that is a very large gap between two official definitions right now now if you basically say all right we are going to look at some alternative definitions based on whether we look at night lights data or we say look let's take a definition that other countries use so for instance a 5000 person uh, population threshold or a 2500 person population threshold then something even more absurd happens which is that kerala goes from being 16% statutorily urban to 99% urban right now so what you effectively have is a state that is perhaps virtually 100% urban now anyone who spent time driving through kerala knows this to be true which is that the entire state is one large city it's just one large urban conurbation so but you've got a state that is effectively almost 100% urban being governed as if it were only 16% urban right and then you run into all the issues that prithika mentioned and and we can now break it down at every state of india what does it look like and so on and so forth so what you get as a consequence is so for instance against to stick with the kerala example there is um, 
um, uh, there is, um, I think, is it, is it a census town, Kandavan Hills? Is it a, it, it is a census town. Okay, so uh, it's a, you know, technically a village of Kanandevan Hills in, in it, it's near Munar. And the population of Kanandevan Hills is 55,000, right? Now, in which world do you think that a population of 55,000 people is a village? Right? Now, as it turns out, in the case of Kanandevan Hills, it is run by the tea companies and so on and so forth. So all this alternate infrastructure that Pritika mentioned is actually provided by the private sector. But these very same examples of, you know, villages with 50,000 people exist in parts of Uttar Pradesh, in Maharashtra and so on, where there isn't the backup secondary infrastructure provided by the private sector. Then you run into real trouble, right? So, so that's broadly the set of issues around. But fundamentally, it kind of goes back to the question of what do you mean by urban? And so... The mistake that most people make is when you hear the word urban, you assume that there is some standardized global definition that we're using. There is no standardized global definition. We are making it up. And it so happens that we picked, as India, we picked a particularly onerous definition of urban, which makes it really hard to become urban. So, you know, what you guys said reminds me of my time in Bhivandi. So there was a brief period between 2008 and 2010 where I, along with my family, we made the genius decision of actually having a factory. So we are, we are a textile background family. I, I am no longer a textile background family. Look at the smile in my face. I am no longer a textile <laughs> background family. <laughs> so... Before I was a podcaster, I used to run uh, two factories, one in Navi Mumbai, one in Bhivandi. Something very peculiar I used to observe in Bhivandi. So there was in, in Bhivandi, there was an urban area where there were textile units. It is called Saravli MIDC, MIDC being the Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation. And then there was, so literally you have this main highway. On one side, you have Saravli MIDC, and then you have rural Bhivandi. And I would always wonder that every time they would try to convert rural Vivandi into urban Vivandi, the biggest resistance would come from the people itself. And one day I just had to ask them because there were some textile units that were owned by local politicians also. I mean, via via. So it's like their money, but somebody is like the main guy, the front. And I, I had to find out. I asked that person. Why do you guys object to every time it becoming urban? Isn't it nice to be urban? Is it, huh? What is so nice about being urban? More taxes, more scrutiny, more this, more that. I was like, damn, these people think like this. And that's what, so when Pritika was mentioning this, I immediately went back to my own Bivandi experience from years ago. I was like, I can totally relate to why in India it is a fight to, you know, in India, it, it's actually, you have to convince people to go and tell them, it's like, it's okay to be urban. <laughs> it's not a big deal because they're so scared about it. Because the fire norms changes, like small things like that, right? If you and, are and, urban, exactly, and and then you you have to provide all these facilities, right? Yeah. Why bother, right? I mean, it's a good place to be to pretend like you 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 are rural. Enjoy all the subsidies, and and by the way, the the, the budgets are also much larger, right? I mean, so. You, you, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice place to, it's, it's a nice place to be. By the way, I would also ask the question of, and this is controversial, nobody in government wants to hear this, but one could also ask the question of why do we have a rural development ministry and an urban development ministry, right? In the ideal world, it's not like there is some sharp demarcation where this is where urban ends and this is where rural begins, right? In what, re in reality, what happens is they're all kind of spilling into each other. So from a national perspective, what we should be focusing on is economic development. And we should have an economic development ministry that takes care of economic development without getting into this entire conversation about is it rural, is it urban, should we provide something else for... It's just pointless. Just focus on the economic development piece. Right? Uh, I, and I don't know when you... Uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to get into the importance of urban question as well, because I think that's incredibly important to get into because people don't understand it. Yeah. And in fact, let me paraphrase it like this. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been someone who has annoyed people multiple times to this message. The, I'll tell you what gets to me the most. 
sometimes people use lines like this i'm going to use the hindi line and then i'll translate it in english for the benefit of our listeners and viewers every time i listen to this line asli gaon asli bharat to gaon mein rehta hai as like excuse me what if i go by the most you know fair definition 47 48% of india is urban what i uh, matlab pritika and i and rubin we are all nakli bharat now secondly india is the first largest urban metropolis that we know of right now as per current archaeological evidence millions of people lived across from all the way from the gujarat area to that all the way to pakistan which is the indus valley civilization millions of people we have ports we have settlements we have drainages like what were those people nakli bharat I, I, it it gets to me so maybe pratika now we start over here why are cities important um so so i like to say so so, so just one to your point on 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 asli bharat right i the thing that i always say is think about it at some point either us or our parents or our grandparents made the choice to move to a city right which is why we live in a city today and they did so because they maybe for a better opportunity they did so maybe because they were trying to escape discrimination or people do it because of aspiration and i think that's the biggest thing we deny when we say things like people should just stay in the villages why should they just stay in the villages maybe they aspiration to live in a city so so totally agree on that um on the point about why cities matter um so you know we always like to say that the cities are physical manifestations of markets right and of, of uh, and and ultimately so that's what explains the indus valley civilization for instance so so many civilizations through history especially ones that have grown around ports and different points of commerce right people come together to do business they come together for jobs for opportunities to improve their lives and then cities become the physical manifestation of that um so if you look there's research that shows actually through through time um in history urbanization and growth have been highly correlated right so you know every oecd country today is well over 70% urban but what's interesting is that correlation is beginning to break down in the developing world and you're actually beginning to see agglomeration so people moving to cities without corresponding increases in growth right and part of that is because we are not investing enough in regulating that growth so a the pace of that growth the pace of people moving to cities is a lot faster than it ever has been in history and that's one of the big reasons that we focus so much on organization because there's a small window to get this right so what's happening is that where agglomeration has led to growth in the past now agglomeration is leading to congestion right which is undermining the the value of um and so 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 you know it's very important that, i mean the reason that it matters to have whether it's fire safety codes or building you know some somebody in charge of building roads arterial roads basic infrastructure is you need some way to plan and regulate that growth not in a way that stifles markets but in a way that at least regulates them lightly um uh, you know in order to to uh, you know unlock the benefits of growth but i'd like to be shed some more light on that yeah so um so um kushal uh, you mentioned in indus valley civilization i think the the most important contribution of the indus valley civilization which goes unrecognized is that the indus valley civilization was built on grids and hopefully we will have time to come to the issue of grids because i think that's actually incredibly important when it comes to urban planning and and so on and so forth because i think the grid is the way to do it uh anyway so so i think just to pull back on the on the centrality of economic growth uh, i mean of, of the urban question so in 1800 the world was approximately 3% urban right um in 2008 or so we crossed the threshold of being 50% urban so in effect after millennia the species has become urban right and that threshold was crossed 15 years ago we are going to basically see in the next say 15 to 20 years that is going to grow to about 75% urban and this is what some scholars kind of describe as the urbanization project right and when that is done when you get to 75 80% it will stabilize at that level so this is the opportunity it it will last about 20 to 30 years to get it right 
So now, now if you look at that pro process of what will happen in the next 30 years, about 2.5 billion people will urbanize across mostly Asia and Africa. And about 170 million people, further people will urbanize in, the, in what we call the developed world. So the urbanization that needs to happen in the next, say, 30 years is primarily a, a Asia-Africa story, right? Latin America is, is already at 70% thresholds, more or less. So that is one part of it, which is that it is going to happen. It is best we prepare for it. It is best we get it right, right? So, uh, so that's one part of it. And we can get into the dynamics of why it will happen. Right. So there is that dynamic and that dynamic has to do with the fact that cities are fundamentally job markets. Right. Cities are job markets. Um, you know, maybe the three of us live in cities because we appreciate the museums uh, and the cultural life and so on. But the average person who moves into a city is likely moving into a city because that's where the jobs are. So this incredible pool of of cities because that's where economic activity is that's where jobs are there is no point trying to fight against that market pressure and in fact every attempt to try and fight it has basically ended up not just in failure but in the disastrous results that you see littered across the indian city landscape so you keep fsi low and you keep far low and you end up with slums and so on and so on. we can we can get into the dynamics of it as we go on but uh, so let me park that for the time being here and go back to the question of the importance so i think the uh, you know back when i first used to lecture about this the slide that i used was i just used the gdp slides right i mean and so i would make it was a pop quiz and i would have these slides that showed gdp and i would have a bunch of countries on there on the slide and then i would have a couple of uh, bars on the in, on in the graph that were anonymous right and people had to guess what these were and it's hard to describe all of this in the abstract on the on the podcast but simply put basically what you would see in that graph was that a city like tokyo greater tokyo was bigger than canada and this by the way, this particular uh, uh, graph has become more less and less interesting over time. So when I first started doing it, Tokyo was bigger than Russia. In GDP. Now, now just think about that, right? With all of its natural resources, all of those things put together, you have a city in Japan that is actually bigger than Russia in pure GDP terms. If you look at New York and Tokyo, both of these cities, and Tokyo is quite a bit bigger than New York. Uh, but New York and Tokyo were bigger than Australia, Iran, Turkey. There's any number of these countries that you think of as economic powerhouses. And these cities were significantly bigger than that. Now, even in the Indian context, now we don't have accurate numbers for cities like Bombay and, and Delhi and so on. But I would argue that cities like Bombay and Delhi are probably bigger than the entire economy of Pakistan. Right? If you assume it to be about $300 billion, it's probably bigger than Pakistan. So this is why cities matter. So, so every time I hear you know, states in India coming up with their trillion dollar ambitions, my question is, how do you plan to get there? Right. So if you take Maharashtra, just to take that example, Maharashtra was one of the first states to say a trillion dollar economy. The question you have to ask is, what is the plan to get there? So for that, you have to first say, what is Maharashtra today? And Maharashtra today, give or take, I mean, we haven't looked at recent numbers, but give or take will be between, say, 400, 450, 500. It'll be in that sort of range, the GDP of a state like Maharashtra. Now, if you ask how much of that is just Bombay and Pune, it's likely to be 70, 75% of Maharashtra's economy is likely to be Bombay and Pune. So if you plan to if you plan to basically get uh, Maharashtra to a trillion trillion dollars, by definition, you should have a plan in mind to double the size of Bombay. What is that plan looking like? Right now, now we have ideas for that, but this is the way one needs to think about it because. Economic growth just doesn't happen just in the abstract, right? I mean, it happens because there are engines that drive it. And cities are primarily the engines of economic growth. So therefore, you have to focus on the cities. 
that's the key i couldn't agree more and again what i'm about to read is are are kind of my views uh, please don't attribute it to ruben or pritika but i'm reminded of something ambedkar said on 4th november 1948 this is during i think the constituent assembly debates when ambedkar said what is a village but a sink of localism a den of ignorance narrow mindedness and communalism i mean i couldn't agree more with the man on, on this point i mean, i don't know why people don't like cities it's like i have never understood what is so special i mean are i mean why do you want to go there what is so special there i mean uh, better for women's rights I, just look at it most parameters it uh, more economic opportunity more freedoms you have the freedom to choose right you can choose to be socially conservative in a city and still live your life right Mm-hmm. i mean it's just an amazing thing but now let's get into the nitty gritties of what you but, guys have said can i just add one more point about ambedkar um, and i think this is this is important because one of the things you'll notice is that most of the people who go on about the great value of rural life actually live in cities <laughs> i mean it's very easy to and by the way this is one of the things that ambedkar actually pointed out about mr gandhi which is that having lived in porbandar bombay uh, amdavad london johannesburg i mean what, on, on what basis do you make these claims about cities I, about rural india rather right i mean because all you've actually known is urban india and so ambedkar felt very strongly about it because the way he the the way in which he was brought up was very different from the way gandhi ji was brought up mm-hmm. yeah and not only that see i i see two parallels you you're right i see a fascination for socialism from people who are literally using like i i sometimes hear podcasters and youtubers talking about the merits of socialism on the most capitalist tool ever i e youtube and and in my brain i'm like in hindi tumko sharam nahi aati and like aren't you ashamed like do you realize how good you have it because of all these tools that cities and free markets have given you are, are there flaws in these systems absolutely and that's the whole point which is why this podcast is titled reforming urban india because we did mess it up but to say that the problem itself is fundamentally flawed it, it it bugs me no end i just before coming on this podcast like pritika and i were talking about traffic in mumbai because we could relate to it we are both in mumbai we could we were just whining about our traffic and we just sharing our common hatred for how hard it is to go but not once in the entire conversation that pritika say i am dumping mumbai and i am going to the nearest village <laughs> that i can go and live and she's not because it's amazing to live here it's 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 just brilliant so maybe now let's get into specific problems obviously here i, I guess ruben pratika we might have to focus on india because that's where a major chunk of our problems are and and as i was going through the material you guys shared with me and i went through them so if so so do we focus first on like i don't know you guys can decide do we first focus on the metro cities let's say in you know in delhi is the extended area just like mumbai we have the mumbai metropolitan region right which consists of navi mumbai thane and mumbai city itself along with the suburbs so so i don't know uh, wherever you guys want to take it you you can take it from there so what are the current issues that we are facing and what could be the possible solutions also then so uh, i i let pritika uh, come in on the on the current issues but uh, so so if you i think the question you ask is a comp- requires a complicated response which is if you want the bang for the buck in terms of economic uh, growth and all of those things then clearly there is a lot of attraction towards changing things in delhi and mumbai and so on and so forth the problem however is political right precisely because the there are very well entrenched interests in all of these places and so the pushback to any reform is going to be significantly greater than uh if you do it you know out of sight out of mind kind of thing so so i think i just keep the political economy piece of this in mind because 
ultimately we are dealing with a issue where at some level the solutions are all well known at least to the practitioners it's well known right it's the political economy of reform that makes it really really hard sorry prithika over to you no no completely agree and and i think that is linked to perhaps the first issue that i'll talk about which is i think the first thing we need to do before getting into a specific city is just recognizing the extent of our group um and so one of the things we did you know so we did this work on urban definitions where we applied different definitions to uh, you know to existing data but we also set up a geospatial lab and just looked at india from the sky using satellite data and what you see actually is not you know not isolated cities but cities that grow into one another cities that grow along corridors and so we have to understand and appreciate the the sheer scale of our urbanization and the patterns of the urbanization so it's very interesting i remember we were looking at two cities in rajasthan um and when you look at them you know as cells on an excel file when you're just trying to figure out what the definition is what you can't see is that these two cities are almost like magnets being pulled into one another right so you're seeing densification you're seeing transit developing between these two cities so i'd say and the other thing we saw is actually the fastest growing cities or you know fastest growing towns are, are not the bombays and the delhis and all of that it's the the small towns that are growing at 8% a year because like we've been said earlier you know people are coming for jobs are coming for opportunities and so i'd say the first issue really is that we need to we need to recognize the extent of growth and there are there are tools to do this um then we need to start planning ahead for growth okay right? we also need to retrofit existing growth and i'll get to that in a second and planning ahead for growth you've been mentioned grids uh you know it's easy to give the example of what uh you know new york did um or what barcelona did right which is they they conducted this mental exercise saying you know if 200 years from now this was in new york's case in 1811 if the city grows beyond the current uh, uh confines how will we plan for it right? and they put in place a notional grid and then as the population grew they built out along the grid and that's today's grid of new york right and grids are perfect because you know they carry public transport they can carry infrastructure it's just an organized way you can do what you want within the plots but you've got your sort of the bones in place um and it, you know it's easy to look at new york and barcelona as an example but in fact you know many years ago when we first started doing this work ruben and i were in jaipur and we had some time after a meeting and so we went to the you know the old city of jaipur everything we had just talked about about grids what major arterial roads minor arterial roads was right there in front of us right so we don't even need to look too far so the question is can we plan ahead to go hundred years ago in jaipur yeah so so that's when we stopped using new york and barcelona as as the examples um Uh, and we need to retrofit in a good so i'd say the, the the best practice for this really actually is amdabad so what uh, what they've been able to do in terms of uh, you know acquiring land as the city grows acquiring land to build core infrastructure and what they've done to retrofit in a city growth to widen uh, you know so to, to widen roads let buildings grow taller so that there's more infrastructure to service them i think really is best practice so that's the first thing we need to do the second problem we need to solve is that of housing you know so so uh, we've mentioned this earlier because we closed our eyes and failed to acknowledge that people were moving to cities we ended up with slums um you know and that is uh you know a, a, j- just a huge disservice to anyone that's coming to try to build a you know foothold in the city and access opportunities um so we need to invest in housing we've actually done a lot of work on this um with specifically low cost rental housing because the idea that somebody should come to a city and buy is you know is 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 a lot to expect um also you want mobility right if this city you don't get the job that you want or you get a better opportunity somewhere you should be able to move so say the second thing is housing what's related to that is public transport and there you know there's been a big push already um a lot of cities are building public transport systems one of the things we say is you know metro systems work in certain types of cities uh, but really what we need to be focusing on are buses right so actually most cities in india don't have public transport systems a lot of them rely on state buses buses are easy to deploy routes can be changed as the city grows so not brts but just bus systems and the fourth is i think we need to focus on public health um and what what we mean by public health is everything from waste and landfills to tackling air pollution um because the productivity loss of 
you know, people just falling sick because of lack of access to water and sanitation and, and air pollution is, is huge. So I'd say these are the, the sets of issues that um, we really need to focus on. Urgently. And, and, and Kushal, if I, if I may, right, I mean, because we brought up the grids, um, <clears throat> the, the New York story, um, which Pritika briefly mentioned, which is in 1811, the government gives three commissioners, three, three gentlemen, basically the job of saying, in 200 years, the city will grow to, a po and by the way, at that time, New York has a population of 25,000 people. It basically says in uh, 200 years, the population of the city will grow to 1 million. Now plan for it. So if you look at the south of New York, the south of New York, the streets are a complete jumble, right? I mean, you can't quite tell. And then around 8th or 9th Street upwards, it's the perfect grid, right? So that is literally 1811 and onwards. And so from 1811, what happens in New York is you've got a grid in place. And now remember, Central Park is built in 1870. Uh, but Central Park is nothing but a Lego brick. It's a Lego brick that's been placed onto this existing grid. So what it does is, so it's not, so the beautiful thing about the grid that New York did was that it's not actually presupposing anything. It's not basically saying this will be a financial center or this will be a textile center. It is saying nothing. It is saying if the city grows as we expect it to grow, here is how it will grow. And that's it. So to many of us who kind of like, you know, really struggle with this question of how much regulation is enough regulation, the grid actually gives you a really useful mental model. Because New York, you know, New York in the early days, they were basically nothing but a sweatshop, right? Then it went from sweatshop, it went to garments, which is why you have the garment district. The garment district then went on to become something else. And then it became a financial services business, right? So it's gone through multiple iterations while the, and by the way, the, the population during daytime goes all the way up to 20 million. And all of that, the grid can withstand. Hmm. But it was just a hypothetical planning tool that was put into place. Now, now how does this kind of work play out, right? I mean, so again, if you look at satellite imagery in India, one of the things that you see is urban growth that we see certainly in the south of India tends to be around transit corridors, right? So you see roads uh, primarily. So for instance, you know, in Bangalore, you have Devanali Airport being announced. And at that particular point of time, Devanali is in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing there. And then you start seeing Bangalore begin to expand towards Devanali, right? So you're beginning to see this pattern in Indian cities where the expansion is down transit corridors. Now, there is this plan, for instance, to build the Mumbai-Nagpur Expressway. But now, if you keep in mind what you've seen so far in India over the last 30 years, I think it's a fair bet that a large bit of Maharashtra's urbanization in the Eastern Corridor will actually happen along this highway. And I'm telling you this 25 years ahead of time. Right? Now plan for it. Hmm. Got it. And, and the beauty of it is plan for it literally means reserve the rights of way to the land. It Absolutely. doesn't mean you build anything. If the growth doesn't come, it doesn't come. So the New, the New York grid <laughs> was nothing but a map. Impossible map. It was, a, it was a map with enforcement. Right? So if you look at the early pictures of New York from the late 1800s and so on, you see squatters, you see slums, you see all of that. And the, what the city of New York basically said is, by all means, stay here. But if the city expands to this point, we will clear this area. Mm. Political so, will. Yeah, it's the political will. But it's a 200-year political will that is playing out. So it's a map with enforcement rather than this whole business of let go, let's go acquire land. And no, we are saying nothing of the sort. So, so it's interesting because actually the uh, you know in Indian planning legislation the mechanism for this exists which is the development plan and so you have to make the development plan except the development plan goes well beyond just reserving rights of way and says you will specify what will be here what will be zoned for this what so now the development plan itself takes many years to make 
then it takes many years to be approved then it takes many years you know for it to you know to, to be notified and by then so so colleagues of ours have done this work looking at the deviation between sort of the sanction plan and what actually happens and the market will do what the market wants to do we're making criminals of people because we're putting rules in place that are way too onerous for anybody to follow right so again going back to the point that cities are a market cities reinvent themselves over time you need minimal regulation you need those sort of strong banks of the river but then you have to allow for things to change otherwise you get informality illegality or and then we you know there's a whole other business of chasing um, all of these all of and, and a lot of this kushal to your point that you made earlier comes back to this problem which you know and it, and it's across political ideologies we have this this suspicion of markets that markets can't get things right so therefore we must you know impose our iron will and say that this will be where the schools come in right how do you know that this is an education district maybe it's an education district maybe it's not an education district maybe it's a healthcare zone maybe it's not a healthcare zone hmm talking about bad laws i'm just sharing this as an example i always keep this with me on my laptop handy you guys are going to have a hearty laugh so in the in the great city that both uh, pritika and i live there is something called <laughs> the lime wash register I, i and let me give you guys a history of this so there was a time in british india where cholera and many such things would exist and you know we could not have the kind of uh, hygienic facilities that we could afford so the then municipal corporation of the city of bombay created this we still have this this is the form <laughs> just yes you have to maintain if you are look at the terms and they are now writing this for a laundry shop i can tell you if the bmc wants to get to you it yeah. will get to you it will get to you and and so now i want to talk about something very specific from my experience uh i i hear these stories when i have these dinners or whatever you know they always say you know the one complaint is most cities in india are now becoming unaffordable at these rates because people just can't buy a house uh i would like to discuss this why because fsi in mumbai is is a mystery that nobody can crack and it is different in different areas if you go to mumbai north there is a different fsi if you go to some other area there is a different fsi for people you know who are not indian and are listening to this fsi is equal to floor space index is basically how much you can go vertically right that's pretty much what it decides uh, uh, as far as i am i am understanding yeah. so can we talk about this this like i have heard people saying bro if dharavi gets developed real estate costs will drop in mumbai no builder would want that is that real so i don't know what to say about it go for it prithik <laughs> so so if housing supply increases you know price should drop it there's a there's a long lag when you know uh, uh, that it will take for all that housing supply to be built and i think actually you know we keep saying bombay doesn't have enough land bombay doesn't have enough you know bombay has ample land it's locked up you know in in whether it's in litigation or there's a lot of you know um, government state municipal owned land underutilized land so yes you know if we build housing at the scale that's needed prices will drop that's not there's a huge time lag that's not going to happen anytime soon um so yeah so fsi or floor area ratio in the us is essentially a the multiple of the plot size that you can build on it um yeah, so so bombay has incredibly low fsi for a city of its population right and the argument so typically the argument that was used and to its great credit you know bmc mmrd have been trying to change the legislation they also run up against a uh, uh, public pressure because people don't understand right people are scared what will happen if if uh, fsi goes up um so initially what happened is when people started moving to bombay fsi was seen as a tool to cap growth 
So the thinking was literally, if I don't allow buildings to be too tall, people won't come. And they, people will stay in the villages. Now, that's not going to happen. If you come, all you will do is make, make do with less and less and less space. So first, you know, apartments get subdivided, subdivided, smaller and smaller. Those that can't afford it move to slums, right? So that's what you get in the first place. The second argument that was used is that the infrastructure that exists can't support higher buildings, right? And so it's, it's an argument it's called carrying capacity. So what's the carrying capacity of, of the infrastructure? Now, every city has faced this. Hong Kong has faced this. Singapore has faced this. New York has faced this. It's a dynamic process. So what you do is you allow buildings to go higher. As they go higher, you may ask them to, to set back. And the Bad is doing this, actually, a little bit further from the road. So you can widen the road and you can increase the infrastructure. London has done this, right? You charge betterment levies, developer exactions, you finance it. It's a, it's a dynamic process that allows a city to grow over time. Now, you know, Bombay has a number of perversions. So that the, you know, the, the one thing that's pretty stunning is if you look at Ballad Estate, Ballad Estate doesn't have tall buildings and it has very wide roads. The FSI in Ballad Estate is four and the FSI ev almost everywhere else in Bombay is 1.3, right? And the only difference um, is, an, uh, sorry, I may be getting a bit technical here, is that, um, so typically there's either land under buildings or there's land in, in, in public, in, uh, in streets and public space, right? And best practice is 60% of your land should be in buildings, 40 should be in open space. That's how you get white roads. Um, in, in, in Indian planning legislation, there's this odd perversion, right? So you've got, um, when you build on a plot, you have to set back from the walls of the plot. You have to build what we know as the compound wall, and then you need to have space in the compound, and then your building stands, right? So you get a tall building, lots of space between the building and the compound wall, which is walled off, and then narrow streets. So Indian cities, and this is Bim, uh, Bimar Patel, except this is his, his work, and it's incredible. So if you look at something like Nariman Point, you've got maybe 25% of land in buildings, maybe 30 to 40% of land, in private open space, so th these are our compounds, and then a small sliver of land in streets. And in lower Perel, that amount of land in streets is something like 12%. Now, obviously, you will get congestion, and obviously, you will get high prices when the amount of land you can build on is circumscribed, and the amount of land that you have for streets is also circumscribed. And all you are is floating around in these sort of large pools of land. The other thing is, if you look at any of the, this, this may be a very Bombay-specific example, but if you look at any of the tall, uh, 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 buildings in Mumbai, in order to achieve tall towers, you need a lot of land. So you aggregate a lot of land and then you use the FSI to build a very tall tower, but then essentially you're floating in a lot of space. Um, and so the, the short answer to that long thing is yes, liberalizing FSI in Bombay it would make a big difference to affordability across the board. I have a follow up question, uh, Ruben, uh, and, uh, and before you come in. For you, one of the biggest problems I face uh, when I study urban uh, real estate issues is uh, low income housing. Uh, Ruben, uh, just, just to add to the question because I forgot to ask it. Do you think if we improve the FSI situation, it would actually help the, poor, the, the lower income groups the most? And, and now you can uh, take it over. Yeah, so just to, just to uh, let me just come in with, with an example of how what Prithika described as the disconnect between public open space, private open space, and so on. So first of all, if you look at, uh, so this private open space, which in Narman point is upwards of 50%. If you look at Regent Street or Piccadilly uh, Circus in London, you know, which is like, we, you think of it as core central London, 3% is in what we call private open space, right? So the efficiency of land use you see it in a place like London, and you do not see it in a place like Nariman Point, even though most Indians would consider Nariman Point to be ultra dense. Right? It's not. Now, how does this actually play out in, in theory? Is basically so this was on my most recent visit to Bombay from our office in Bandra. We were going to a cafe, a new cafe that had opened up for dinner. So we said it's close enough by, let's walk. So we walked. And it was about a seven to 10 minute walk. And as you can imagine, not a particularly pleasant seven to 10 minute walk. Now, after that, just out of curiosity, because I just wanted to see this, uh, where this restaurant was 
on a map. So I looked up Google Maps and it's basically about two buildings behind us. Right? So if you just eliminated all those compound walls, it would have been at best a one minute commute. Instead, it has been converted into a 10 minute commute. On, right? on, on very poor roads. So this is the sort of thing that you constantly see. Um, now, to your point about uh, low-income housing, um, I, I'll, I'll let Pritika come in as well. But as a general principle, yes, if you... So I think there's two ways to answer that question. First of all, um, I think if you care about low-income housing, you should also care about rental, right? Because I think that is the most important piece for any migrant who's coming into a city. They are not looking to buy anything. Just like when any of us went abroad or wherever it is that we went, we were not, our first instinct was not to go buy a house, right? Our first instinct is to be able to rent a place. So I would argue that we need to dramatically, especially in the cities which, I, in the cities which attract large numbers of migrants, we need to dramatically increase the, the amount of rental space that is available to incoming migrants where they can either, you know, so it's a, it, think of a hostel dormitory kind of model, right? I mean, I want to hire a bed or I want to hi hire a shared space, something along those lines, but with a decent bathroom, decent common kitchen, something along those lines. So a college mess and IIT hostel, you know, you could use any of these kind of, that's really what you're looking at. So we need to think about it. Now, what happens in rental housing? So in the past, we had done a bunch of work and we had run into this company in Hyderabad, which actually had managed to crack how to do urban rental housing. And then they stopped. And you realize what was going on is, so they had, they had basically cracked a kind of dormitory housing model. Now, the problem with dormitory housing models is that once you cross a certain number of threshold of rooms, you automatically become a hotel. And all the regulations change, making the entire dormitory model that you've built unfeasible. Right? So this is a little bit of that small scale industry problem all over again, which is there are inbuilt things that prevent scale. Whereas this should be a massive rental housing opportunity and business that people should, you know, basically take up. On the on the FSI question, uh, Pritika, you can come in on, on you know, just generally increasing the stock of available floor area. Yeah, yeah. And I think we, we, we had done this work um, um, on affordable housing a couple of years ago, and we called it instead of the, the idea was how do you increase the supply of housing, right? So not how do you, usually right now what we do is we, sub, housing is expensive to build for a variety of reasons. And then we, you know, we apply subsidies to it, right? Instead, look at the supply chain. Why is housing so expensive to build in the first place, right? And you realize it's because, you know, parcels of land need to be connected by transport. So you can open up, um, Hong Kong does a great job of this, open up new parcels of land. Um, uh, uh, you know, permits and uh, uh, approvals take 18 months, you know, the sheer cost of capital. Then there are fairly onerous requirements. So even a low cost home needs one or two parking spots. I mean, that adds a cost and it's, you know, chances are the person in a low income home doesn't have two cars. I mean, very few people have two cars. Um, so we looked at essentially the, the entire supply chain of providing housing. Um, and, and, and certainly, you know, reducing um, restrictions on zoning, uh, increasing FSI, all of that goes a long way towards liberalizing the yeah. So it can't be a single solution, Kushal. It has to be a multiple bunch of things that come together, including, by the way, listening to the end user. Because a lot, of, so by the way, I, I was actually involved in spinning out a housing company. So we learned the very hard way, uh, all the problems of building housing in India. Because a lot of the time what happens is what we had in mind versus what people want. There's a complete disconnect there, right? Uh, and, and so on. But, but the bottom line, and Pritika kind of hinted at it, if your capital cost, let's assume for a second your capital cost of 15%, mm -hmm. and there's an eight-month approval process, right? Guaranteed, you're not building low-income housing. You're building condos because that structure can only allow you to build condos. 
So, so are there ways around this? I think there are ways around this. I mean, we haven't tried it, but I think we should, which is to basically, for instance, I'll just give you a random idea, right? So for instance, if you say, so by the way, we also, again, affordable housing is one of these things where we have to be clear about definition because affordable housing in Bombay is very different from affordable housing in Coimbatore, right? I mean, in Bombay, if you have a house, house for 30 lakhs, that would be affordable housing. In, in Coimbatore, 30 lakhs would be, you know, upper middle income housing. Okay. So, so there's there's all these differentials that we need to play. But keep what at, at, a, at a local level, keep whatever threshold you want, right? So you say 15 lakhs is affordable housing, okay? And if you're priced below that price point, then you get automatic approvals within three months. And if you don't get those approvals, then the then the burden of proof has to shift to the bureaucrat to basically say, why aren't you letting this project go ahead? Mm. Right? This will not apply to high income hubs. So if you if you're building a three crore building, you know, it goes through the standard process. But at least for the very low end of the market, is there a way to clear up the supply side hurdles? Right. I mean, when I say that I was involved in this business of trying to build housing, that all of that came from the perspective of the problem is on the demand side. Actually, there's no problem on the demand side. Most of the problems are on the supply side. Man, can and I can I just say that this is such a complex system because what you hear from Babus is so different. Like what they try to say is is so different. They I they mean, have a problem with they, they essentially. I mean, I'm not going to take names. I've I've met people in my yeah, my yeah. whole <laughs> life of doing some social activism, and now being a podcaster. Man, they say very different things. Why? <laughs> no, I know why, but I mean, why why should we suffer? My my why was not a why question mark. My why was like why kind of thing. So so look, I mean. I, Look, so I, I, I'll give you a, one example of this, right? So one example of this is anytime you talk about increasing FSI, you're in cahoots with the re real estate guys because the real estate guys also want increased FSI. Actually, the real estate guys do not want increased Don't FSI. want it. Yes. yes. They, they want, want it. They want increased FSI for themselves. Yes. They do not want increased FSI for the city. Yes, because that would drop the price and they must have bought huge pockets of land at, at 500, 600, 700 crores. Classic case, I don't know if uh, if Pritika would remember the biggest problem being uh, land prices in BKC. You remember the problem there? Yeah. No, no absolutely. So, so this whole idea that we are, you know, so, I mean, uh, all of these accusations have been thrown at us. When we say things like increase FSI, the immediate thing is, you know, yeah, you're in, you're in cahoots with the real estate guys. I'm like, guys, what we are advocating for is actually entirely antithetical to the interests of the real estate guys. Yeah. And so, so we made an important uh, distinction, right? So Ruben was talking about, you know, what looks affordable in different cities matters. So there's, there's been this big national effort, not now, but, you know, 10, 12 years ago to say, okay, what is an affordable home, right? And it was tried to be measured in terms of the size of the house, the price of the house. But these things just not going to apply across cities of different sizes. So the way we approached it was, how do you make housing affordable? Make housing something that is affordable to build. And that the answer lies in, you know, in, in, in opening up parcels of land, in uh, doing approvals faster, in liberalizing not just FSI, but zoning restrictions. Make housing a less difficult and expensive thing to build. And, and, and rental housing. I mean, it has to be a housing. very large part of the answer. You know, one significant difference, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is whatever little I've tried to read is, in fact, in a very major way, a sign of a successful city is how many people in that city just live on rent. Because, you know, that's the urban life. Today, I have a job here. Tomorrow, I have a job there. Maybe I don't own a house. Yes, in my old age, somewhere down the line, I moved to the suburbs where, you know, literally, it sounds like I'm going to Sanyas Ashram or One Press Ashram to use, uh, use the Indian adage. And and uh, that's when maybe I don't know. But... Uh, Pritika, what do we do about this typical Indian mentality? I'm sure 
Ruben, you also know this. Your parents must have told you. Pritika, your parents must have told you. The classic line is, but we have to own a house, right? Because every major city in the world, whether it's Toronto, New York, most people are living on rent. I mean, but in India, what? You don't have a house? Why don't you have a house? Yeah. You, you know, I, I think <laughs> I, I, I'm laughing because we, we, we have talked about this a lot. Um, maybe in some sense, it's just, it's, you know, in a, in a, we've grown tremendously as a country, but in a poor country, security matters. And where there's no social welfare system, you feel like you need to sec secure your basics, right? If I don't have a house, I don't have a social housing system I can rely on. I don't have a shelter I can go to. And so that need to own a house and just own the assets that you can own is really important. You know, it's the same reason to some, like even like owning gold, right? I think it's a security thing. Um, and, you know, at the upper end of the spectrum, that's fine. And that anywhere in the world, right? you can choose to rent, you can own, you can have multiple homes, it doesn't matter. But I think at the low income, it's a sense of insecurity and that, you know, if I don't have this, who am I going to and what am I going to rely on? I mean, and I and I think you know to just add to that, I, it, it, the house, gold, all of these are the ultimate hedge against a dysfunctional state. Yeah. That's really what it kind of comes down to, and so this is kind of like you know transmitted over generations into us. But what has also happened is that in between all of this, people have also got it into their heads that somehow this is a great investment idea. Yeah. <laughs> And, and that's where I, you know, look, for whatever emotional reasons you want to buy a house, be my guest. I have no problem with it. But I think once you get into this game of which is then fueled by the, you know, by the, by the advertisers, everybody feed into this frenzy. But the truth is, as a long-term investment, unless you're invested through a portfolio approach into housing, housing is actually a pretty bad investment. You're locking up money into a single asset for you know, obscene amounts of time and in places like the US where the research has actually been done, because the US also used to have a fairly, you know, again, there's a long <clears throat> history to this, but it's this business of the ownership society in the US, which then gave all these enormous uh, you know, subsidies into building housing, especially subsidized housing outside of cities and so on and so forth. You will actually see this in the data now because it's been investigated, is that it has led to, to your point, Kushal, a lowering of social mobility. You no longer have the ability to just up sticks and leave, which was at some level, that was the American dream, right? I mean, you could move to where the opportunities were, but suddenly you're locked into your biggest asset being in one particular area. And what that means is you're now locked into the economy of that area. And so if that economy goes for a toss, that's it game up for you. So I think, you know, so if you look at, and, and I think it's important to also mention that countries like Switzerland, for instance, I mean, Switzerland has maybe 35% of the population that owns houses, right? I mean, 65% of people rent. Uh, and, you know, I would argue that at $95,000, they're a pretty damn successful economy. So, so I think, yes, that, that shift needs to happen as well. But look, that's a, I don't think that's a fight we're going to win anytime soon. Uh, I think, therefore, our focus should be in terms of when the poor move in. We should not get them into situations where they have to own or they're caught in these bizarre uh, situations because of just bad policy decisions. And instead, give them, you know, a, you know, if you look at a housing ladder, which is how we had th sort of thought, the bottom most rung of a housing ladder is rental housing. You've got to give them the ability to get on the ladder. Yeah. And, and by the way, you could argue that rental housing already exists. So half the slum properties are probably, you can call them rental yeah. housing. But when I say rental housing, I mean decent housing with a proper toilet. Running water, drainage, drainage water, everything. All of those things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. In fact, one of the funniest things, again, part of our culture is like, uh, uh, I have nothing against arranged marriage. I'm just using like, even in arranged marriage, one of the criteria is that does the person on both sides have a house or not? I mean, it is so funny. I, I, I just, I, I find this Indian obsession of owning the house very unique. 
or, or or owning a car for that matter like my wife and i a few days ago were having a discussion we should also not own a car why do we need a car if we are just living in a city you, you today living in a city like mumbai it's not like i can afford it but i can rent a ferrari every day if i want to there, there are companies that do these things and i i took but okay now i have to talk about the one thing that everybody says in india what is with indians and their love for the planning of chandigarh <laughs> you're picking all our favorite topics kushan <laughs> it it annoys me look i have nothing against i have family in chandigarh and panchkula before my family members call me on the phone and say oye as a calm down but that's a really badly planned city can we talk about it that is the indian example of we have such a good city yeah no uh, prithika you should go for it because prithika is actually a trained city planner but look all i can say is you know if 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 a metric of a successful city is a thriving economy and so on and so forth then chandigarh has clearly demonstrated to you that it's an absolute failure and the only successful thriving part of chandigarh is actually the most unplanned part of it ai mohali ai mohali or mani majra the yeah. the one near mani majra yeah sorry it could pretty cover to you so i i agree completely and kushal i also have family in chandigarh chandigarh is is sort of the dream right i can plan these roads i can you know allocate space for different things and you know may, look it it may have applied at a point in time right when population growth to cities was slow right and you could manage it the, the i mean exactly what what you know what ruben and you said i mean the, the success of chandigarh actually is, is outside of it so i think the fundamental so look chandigarh looks attractive to us as indians is because we're like wow there's order there are streets you know there are pavements uh, you know there are um, uh, you know there are good municipal services but i think the fundamental problem is so chandigarh doesn't allow itself to scale right because there are restrictions on what can be built ideally what should happen within those wide streets and those plot areas and everything that's demarcated the first thing that should happen is a the city will expand and b those lovely leafy bungalows that we all enjoy staying in should densify and become taller right more people on the same amount of land right um it's just it 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 it's restrictive and so growth goes elsewhere right so i think our attraction to chandigarh is very it's just a you know lovely little oasis of order uh, but it's it's it, you know we we talk about inclusion chandigarh is is very exclusionary i mean how do you how do you move to chandigarh as a young migrant that what that may find a job in chandigarh you know how do how do new businesses service industries set up in chandigarh if you can't take the same plot of land go higher tabling down and 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 so so yeah i, I mean yeah I, i think i think that's exactly right i mean so you know by comparison you can look at say ottawa in canada or canberra in australia you don't exactly see people beating down the hatches uh, dying to move from toronto to move to ottawa or montreal to move to ottawa right or indeed from Thank melbourne you. to move yes to, move to canberra so yeah i think i think these are just you know some what we crave is a well done city a well ordered city a city that functions all of those things and so because we can't get any of that in our existing cities we crave this optimal out there so so by the way so i think this is an important one because i think it's also important to because you know when we say the word city or we say the word urban the thing that comes to mind in the average indian mind is the chaos of mumbai or the chaos of bangalore right that's what snaps into people's mind so two problems one there are any number of cities out there right i mean there are cities that have 100000 population 50000 population so a city does not necessarily mean that you have to then move into the biggest possible city there are many many options that are available to you so in 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 the case of the united states as an example one of the great successes of the united states or now you're seeing this in china as well is the fact that it's been able to grow many many engines at many many sizes yeah. right so you can live in chicago you can live in new york you can live but you can also live in columbus ohio you can live in knoxville tennessee there's any number of these kind of options available to you right so that's one of the key differentiators that we need to make that is one 
The second thing is when we think about cities, we also have to remember that there are perfectly functional cities that need to come to mind as well. Yeah. Right? Zurich is a city. London is a city. Tokyo is a city. So just because our cities are dysfunctional does not mean cities are dysfunctional. If our cities are dysfunctional, it is because we've made them dysfunctional over time. Exactly. Now, let us talk about uh, a few solutions. Again, two specific projects that are often touted. One is this whole thing, and, and Ruben, you had written about it, this whole SEZ model, because I think SEZs are also kind of very important when it comes to the whole idea of urban development, because the idea behind it, and correct me if I'm wrong, from whatever I've understood, it leads to economic development. And whenever there is economic development, there are other second order, third order effects around it which leads to further development. And the second one is, uh, which has been touted as smart cities. First of all, I have a huge problem with this uh, entire terminology itself. I mean, what, there is a dumb city and then there is a smart city or there is a technically sound city. I, I just don't understand these words. I wish, first of all, Indians were good. You know, we have such beautiful personal names. I wish we gave, we gave better names to our ideas also. So let us focus now uh, on the tentative solutions that are being promoted from the uh, state and society at large. And then let us talk about actual solutions after that. So again... Yeah. So, so with special zones, uh, this will take a few minutes to explain, but let, just indulge me. I think with special zones, one has to take a step back and ask, why do we need special zones? We don't need special zones because special zones uh, are urban experiments or whatever. The end result of a successful special zone is a city, right? But a city is not the starting point. The starting point is a completely different place. The starting point is political economy, which is it is really difficult to do any reform. Right? That's the central problem that you're trying to get at. So, so, so rather than do reforms that are anyways difficult to do at the largest possible scale, is it possible to do it at the smallest possible, smallest and most viable possible scale? That's the question you're asking. So to use the language of operating systems, what so let's take china as the perfect example of this so this is what they nailed under deng xiaoping so deng xiaoping basically realizes that the operating system that china is running on which is let's call it ms dos is massively inferior to what is out there in the market whether that's unix or solaris or any of these things now what i need to do the solution is obvious right which is i need to basically move people from ms dos to solaris but if you've tried to do that in your office department, leave alone at any scale, you'll realize that you will run into political economy issues. Because people will be like, but I'm so comfortable using MS-DOS. Why are you moving me to this thing? And so on and so forth. So he understands fully that this is not going to be feasible in places like Beijing and Shanghai and so on, which already have a wide base of MS-DOS installed. Instead, let me try installing installing Solaris into a place where there is no computers at all, right? Or they're using typewriters. And that place that he discovers is, a is you know, it's also geographically important because it is a place, it was a fishing village that was basically the jumping off point for migration into Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is running Solaris. So all of these people are craving Solaris. So they escape from this point into Hong Kong to get their access to Solaris. Right? And this is a ship fishing village. And so the typical communist uh, kind of response to this would be close the borders hard, punish people who are trying to migrate and so on and so forth. Instead, Deng Xiaoping basically asked the question of what do we need to do to get Solaris here on this side of the uh, water rather than on that side of the water? And that fishing village was Shenzhen. Shenzhen, when it started, had an economy of $160 million and a per capita GDP of approximately $700. Shenzhen then grew, right? And grew and we know the success of Shenzhen today. Shenzhen, as of 2020, has a, a GDP of $400 billion and a per capita income of $30,000. So you've gone from $700 million to 
30,000 in 40 years. I mean, surely the greatest increase in human prosperity ever, the fastest growth in human prosperity that you've ever seen is happened in front of you in Shenzhen. Now, once these things get proven in Shenzhen, it begins to spread across the country. So, for instance, famously, when Deng Xiaoping goes to the Southern Tour in the, in the early 90s, the Shanghainese, for instance, they, they are basically complaining about the fact that Shenzhen has got ahead of Shanghai. Right? And so what happens is the Shanghainese basically get Pudong as their special zone. Right? Now, so that is the origin story of how it became of when you find reform difficult to do, try to scale down the reform into a lab, into a uh, sandbox, try it out, see if it works. And if it works, it begins to scale outwards. Right? So that's the logic of this. Now, there's one other thing to re remember here is that when Deng Xiaoping first introduced these ideas, they were not called special economic zones. They were called special zones. In Within the party, he had very conservative opposition who basically came up saying, look, if you allow for experimentation, the experimentation will surely spill into the political domain and become a threat to the party. And so it was a way to fight off the conservative criticism that he introduces the word economic into special zones. And the message that you're sending is the experimentation should be only in the economic realm. This has basically been misinterpreted to basically mean tax giveaways and all of this kind of stuff, right? And not to mention the fact that where, you know, all of these things require scale. Right? And again, what, what you're doing with Shenzhen is you're basically drawing an imaginary map. And you're saying, within this imaginary map, the rules have now changed. Rather than go and acquire 200 acres of land and declare it an SEZ. Right? So it's a very different approach. And, and keep in mind, the, the, you know, the, the, the Chinese started with four zones. I mean, we started with like hundreds. Right? So all of them subscale. We don't have the capacity required to actually govern any of these things and so on and so forth. So I think we completely mismanaged how to do the SEZs because we thought, thought of it as tax giveaways and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so I think, you know, Paul Romer has a really interesting way to think about it. So he said he calls it a test for whether something is a reform or a concession. The first test is temporal and the temporal test is this particular let's let's say for instance let's say it's a tax tax rebate of some sort does it need to have a sunset or can it go on forever and if it requires a sunset then it means it's a concession if it can if that particular tax reform can go on forever then it's actually a genuine reform and the second condition that paul romer says is geography I, can you do you need to contain this within a certain area or can you let it spread across the entire country and if you need to contain it within a certain area then it's a concession if it needs to if it can spread across the country it is a reform right so that's the way one thinks about this now you know then we can get into the question of what are the obvious places where you can do things like this right and i've written about this as well the most obvious one sitting right in the midst of both of all of our lives is the eastern waterfront of Bombay. It's 900 hectares of empty land. Right? Just think about what you can do there because ultimately when you think of the city of London, the financial hub of London, one of the great financial centers of the world is 150 or 160 hectares. Canary Wharf is 45 hectares. Right? You look at the financial zones of all of these, the Dubai International Financial Center is about 40 hectares. The eastern waterfront of Mumbai is 900 hectares. Just use your imagination to think in terms of what you could do there. By changing the rules, by saying here a different set of rules shall apply. Hmm. Now this whole smart city thing. So I'll give you an example that I was uh, looking up. I, I'm sure you guys know this. Like, how? Do, what do I make of something like this? Suppose there is a fire and uh, somebody came up to you. I don't know what the current status is, but as per 
my last article that I read, which was in October 2022 in the Times of India, in a blaze, our ladder can scale only 30 stories, but skyscrapers must have a working firefighting system too. You know, a person, a normal human being, will read this Pratika and be like, I'm not going up. <laughs> it, you, you, can, you can call it as irrational as it gets. But this is, you know, people think in binaries most of the times. Yeah. They are risk averse, especially Indians uh, in a society that has a scarcity mindset. So when we talk about smart cities, what the hell are, why, like, are we kidding ourselves? So, so we, we always used to say, let's, let's try, let's try dumb cities first. <laughs> um, <laughs> because really, I mean, some of the stuff that you need to get right, uh, you know, is, is are, are the basics, you know, it's the, it's, it's the roads, it's the sewerage lines, it's, it's all of that. I actually remember this, this st story actually from, um, uh, where, so the, you know, the ladder was long enough, but the road was so narrow that the, that the fire engine got in, but then it didn't have the, it just didn't have the leverage to, you know, uh, you know, whatever, raise the ladder. Up. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that we need to fix before we get that. I think, you know, the one thing that we've heard is, look, what the Smart Cities mission managed to do is get cities to actually experiment, try things, you know, again, like mini, mini sandboxes. But so so I think I think you know I think the critical thing again and because we've gone on and on it's it's critical to understand and define what we mean. So when we say smart, what exactly do we mean by the word smart? I think it's sure. I think the the problem with smart cities started with that, which is you know you haven't defined what that word actually means and what has happened and because it's been egged on by the you know, by the IBMs and all the tech companies have egged this on, is that you've equated the word smart with the word digital. Now, digital may be one of the ways in which you express your smartness, but it surely is not the only way you can get to be smart, right? Having a functional bus system is smart. Having functional housing is smart. Having functional drains is smart. This, it's not necessarily digital. Right? The question I always pose to people is, how did Singapore both get to be a great city and a great place to live before the internet? Right? So, so why do we assume that this all, all of this has to do with digital? And I think, you know, broadly speaking, I think this is a curse in India in general, is that because problems are hard to solve, we're looking for magic bullets. And the magic bullets are like, you know, it's microfinance one day, uh, it is smart something or the other, they, they, you know, it's, it's the internet. Nanotechnology, nano, Nanotechnology. it sounds so nice. Yeah. So it's a bunch of these things because they seem like magic bullets. The truth is a lot of these things are actually process re-engineering. In once you streamline your processes, can technology play a role? 100% technology can play a role. But always remember that technology is a means, it's not an end. To make technology in and of itself the end is the problem. Now, having said all of that, as, as Pritika mentioned, I think what the Smart Cities mission has done is it has given us some room for experimentation, which also means that there is still room for experimentation. There are these SPVs that have been set up. So if it's possible to have a you know have a good enough imagination and the ability to take some risk i think the smart cities still provide you a little sandbox to try out something maybe it's analog maybe it's digital but try something new so try something risky to me uh, you know what it sounds like the, the these are words people use to Absolutely. feel good about themselves yeah. 100%. So, you know, there's a famous line in a Hindi movie where, uh, again, I'll do it in Hindi, then translate it in English for the benefit of everyone. They say, Samaj mein nahi aaya, magar sun ke laga. As in, I did not understand what you said, but it's very nice when you say it. 
So it yeah. must have like a lot of times it sound like postmodernism. It makes no sense when you uh, read postmodern literature, but it sounds very good. So it must be very profound. You add big, big words and it ends with the ISM. Everything is an ism. So you know, being a philosophy student, I'm used to reading postmodern literature. And then you, at the end of it all, after reading 100 pages, I'm scratching my head and I'm like, what did I do today? I just read 100 pa pa pages of word salads. So th this is the core problem. Now let's get into real world solutions before I take, because there are a lot of viewer questions also. So tell me, Prithika, let's start with you. Real world <laughs> solutions for India. I mean, we are not going to solve global problems. Let us start at home. It's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I'd go back to, I think the most important thing we need to do is you know, conceptually understand the value of cities. Um, I think we need to understand, you know, or, you know, we, talk, we talked about all the things we like here, right? We're talking about reducing long-term emissions. We talk about growth. We talk about all the things. Understanding how the line to, to a lot of these run through cities. So, a, a, you know, a piece of work we're doing right now um, is, you know, looking at the link between uh, cities and long-term emissions. Right? So if you get urban energy systems right, if you get public transport right, if you get urban form, right, you contain sprawl and have more compact urban development. And if you get construction right, I mean, that's going to solve a lot of long-term emissions. Um, so I'd say, to, you know, to me, it's it's wrapping our heads around, you know, the, the actual extent of growth, planning ahead for the retrofitting existing growth. And within this, I mean, there's a million different things that need to be done. But these are all you know, real world practical solutions that, that, that can be done. I mean, Ahmedabad really has led the way, uh, you know, they've partnered with SEPT over the years. They, they've really done a lot to control how, how the city has grown. Um, and so there's a host of real world solutions in there. Um, so so I, I, a couple of things. One, um, to just build on this, I think there also needs to be a political constituency that is created, right? Because if we are arguing that 50% of the country is urban, then it also means that there is a political constituency out there that is not necessarily being spoken to and spoken about. I think it is important to create that political constituency because ultimately that political constituency will drive the change. right? So I think it's very, very important. I'm, I'm, again, I'm agnostic to which party does it. At some level, AAP and Shiv Sena are urban parties. right? And, and, and they could actually take on the mantle of basically saying we focus on urban India, right? But someone needs to find the political leverage to do it. Beyond that, if I think of cities as primarily, and I think this is a very important point to make, is to me, cities are basically poverty digesters. They take in poverty, poor people, and they cure them of their poverty at some level by getting them to some reasonable standard of living, right? which then means more poor people will come in and so on and so forth. So they actually do a very, very good job of digesting poverty. They're poverty eliminators. So if you look at China, again, as an example, where urbanization has obviously done, a, they've done a much better job with cities than we have. Urban poverty today is less than 1% in, in all of China, right? Less than 1%. That's what we should aim for. So to the extent that we care about poverty and we care about the poor, and we care about what cities can do for the poor. I would go back to what I said earlier, earlier, cities are job markets. So beyond the economic engines that need to fire, now that's a separate argument of, you know, how do you get the economy to fire and all of that? But let's assume for a second that the economic engines are firing. Then I think the two things that you absolutely totally focus on is public transport and affordable housing. Because those are the two things that matter the most to people, which is, a, you know, a reasonable quality uh, roof over my head and the ability to get from my workplace to my home. And by the way, that can also be walking. It doesn't It doesn't have to mean metro systems or anything of the sort. It can also be, I, I need to be able to walk to work. Right? The story of places like Dharavi is exactly that. It's a short commute to work is, 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 a, is what a lot of that comes down to. So, and in, so in that mix, in, in public transport, focus a lot more on buses a lot more attention to buses than we give today. And in housing, a lot more attention to rental housing than we give today. That would be, and by the way, these are politically sellable, right? I mean, it's not like I'm 
a, a fleet of good new buses on the roads is actually a political and you can get it done. It's not like you need hundreds of thousands of crores. You can put buses on the road in six months. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now let's take uh, some of the viewers' questions. Okay, Pratika, first I go to you. <laughs> this is this is a true urban animal. It says, why do we have such narrow roads and no tunnels? Also, why did we wait so long for a metro and ceilings at this rate of development? <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. I'll be too old to enjoy anything in Mumbai. <laughs> I, 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 I feel your pain. <laughs> um, so, you know, why do we have... Yes. So, look, in a city like Mumbai, we waited way too long for the metro. Think of when Delhi started doing the metro. I mean, Mumbai should have started at that time. Right? And... A lot of this goes back to, you know, it, it, a lot of it is political economy. The plan for the coastal road, the plan for, this is from the 70s, right? It's just taken all of this time to, to implement it. Uh, so completely agree there. Why do we have such narrow roads? It's the perversion we talked about earlier. So again, land should be 60% in buildings, 40% in public open space, which includes roads. Um, the way Indian planning legislation is written, most of land is locked up, not even in buildings, but in this privatized open space. You will never see your compound the same way again um, after you see these, these maps, right? The sheer amount of land that is just locked up. And then retrospectively, we justify whether oh, we need it for parking, we need it for this, we need it for that. It's just a, it's just a, you know, a, a planning legislation. And then what's left for roads is really narrow. Then of what's left, uh, there's encroachment. Right? So because we don't enforce proper lane management, we, you know, there are shops on the sides of the roads, you know, people stop on the side of the road. What could even be a 16 meter road effectively is a is a one lane road. Um, and so there's, you know, even more than the physical space available, the actual usable space is, is even less. But, but you know, to add to add to that, I, I suppose the question to the, you know, we could ask the question back to the viewers. Hmm. Are you willing to give up compound walls? Are yeah. you willing to give up parking? Right? Because these are the things that make your life truly miserable at a population scale. Yeah. But if we insist on all of these things for ourselves, then don't expect things to get better. If we are willing to use public transport, if we are willing to use buses, if we are willing to use trains, we use all of that. We're, you know, what is parking? It's parking is basically, you know, the, when I, you know, people, when the poor basically do squatting, we call it slums and illegal. Parking is basically urban dwellers squatting. You're taking a piece of public land and putting a car on it for free. Why is that okay? That is not okay. You have just hurt so many folks in South Mumbai who struggle to find a parking spot. Uh, like one of the things of South Mumbai is where do I park? That's like a proper discussion people have in South Mumbai. Yeah. It's like my car yeah. park karu. It, it is hilarious. Uh, yeah. Okay, someone has solution. asked. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pratika. No, I was going to say there are solutions there as well. I mean, we do need to solve the problem of parking in cities. Uh, but but you know, actually, if we just opened up all those compound walls, and it, it's it's you know, it's what Ruben said earlier. We we always think of this at the plot level. I need this and I need this, and we don't think about how this adds up at the city scale, right? So the city scale. All of these little setback areas that we have around our homes add up to a huge amount of wasted land, which if put in the public domain would also solve the parking problem. And the you know, walking on pavements and wider roads and all of that. One thing about pavements people don't realize, I had attended a presentation by IIT Mumbai where they said because India does not have proper footpaths, it reached to one of the highest contributors to particulate uh, matter. Yeah. And uh, that's what... Uh, people don't realize but then it is what it is what do we do no, all right so Kushal, just to just to drive home that point right i mean and i, I hate to make this overly mumbai centric but 90 percent of mumbaikers use their feet yeah. the primary form of mobility in mumbai is people's feet right you have to respect that and you have to give people the space to walk yeah yeah so next one is uh I guess Ruben can take it. Would we consider all cities that have connectivity to good transport infra and have residential and commercial areas, 1 million plus population? As I think they're asking, like, would this be like a city then with these? At, at, at 1 million? Yeah, 1 million. 
Yeah, so look, I, I don't think there's any standard definition that is even required, right? I mean, I go back to this whole thing of, you know, a lot of this is artificial. It's more a question of can you provide services for a given population size? And I don't particularly care about what governance structure that takes, as long as the services are actually available to citizens. So should 1 million be a city? I don't know. And it's not even clear to me that we need to know. Um, mm. I don't know, Vidika, maybe you have a different view on this. Yeah, so, so how I understood the question, are, are cities with these amenities 1 million? But I think it goes the other way. I think as the city grows in size, you then get the resources to put those amenities in place. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Somebody then, has yeah. asked. Okay. I, anyone can take this. This is fun. What about Soviet style urban planning in India? As the Soviets built new cities or built cities near an old urban city center, so cheap land acquisition, it is. Uh, uh, there is cheap land acquisition and they provide cheap amenities to maximum number of people. Self-contained neighborhoods are although very grotesque. <laughs> I can look at this, uh, the expression on both your faces. They're like, Soviet planning? Didn't we have enough of that? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, I think, I think, again, this whole idea that we have a better sense of the future, the and we know how to lead someone else's life better than they themselves do, I think is just a very, very bad idea. Which is why I keep going back to the New York grid, which is, yes, do you need some amount of planning so that, you know, there needs to be some amount of order, the a way for things to, you know, put be put into place, street grids, all of that. I think beyond that, let's not get overly prescriptive in terms of what gets done here and there and all of that you know just let people be i think we're, yep. we're, we're so desperate for this it you know soviet planning relies on this certain omniscience that doesn't exist but somehow we just want that to deliver us from this from this chaos not um, to mention the not to mention the level of violence that is required to then guarantee enforcement that's just a small part <laughs> That's just a small part. Oh, that 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 little detail we can get over yeah. that. Yeah. But I just if I can add a recommendation, the most my sort of go-to book is it's uh, by Alain Berto called uh, Order Without Design. But it goes to this fundamental thing: cities are labor markets, they're also land markets, right? And the demand for land and what needs what that land needs to do is going to change through time and over history. And cities have to be able to, the, the, you know, the, that the demand has to convert into physical form. Um, and, and sort of saying this is how it shall be is, is a distortion of uh, and, and the And the wonderful thing about Alain Berto, as an aside, is that Alain Berto worked with Le Corbusier to build Chandigarh yeah. and is now writing a book with, whose title is borrowed from Friedrich Hayek. <laughs> Order without design. Hey, it, it doesn't get better than that. That's all we can say. This is a good question. I think Pritika will probably relate to this as she's in Mumbai. Shouldn't the first stage of urban reform be to rectify and set right the land ownership records in cities? A lot of people in cities do not have proper title deeds to their property, especially in small cities. The best example of that, I think the greatest movie ever, uh, Someone I know very well, Ranveer Shori, was in that movie, Khosla Ka Ghosla. Delhi yeah. is the classic example of bad title deeds where one person can do anything. That, I mean, 20 people own the same house. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we actually referred to Khosla Ka Ghosla in our housing report. Um, th th there's no question. Right. I mean, uh, you know, security of title, but most importantly, uh, marketability of title depends on good land records, right? So if you want to up and move, uh, or if you want to buy, you know, a lot of that depends on how clear the land records are. And this is not just a uh, private title. So uh, again, um, you know, Vimal Patel at SEPT did this fantastic work looking at land banks in um, in Ahmedabad, right? So there are these large land banks that are owned by central government, municipal government, state government. Um, and they, they work to the revenue department to pull up the land records, right? But, what we found, what, what he found and what we found in the process is that even government doesn't have a good record of the land that they have. So a lot of land is actually lying 
either vacant, unused, or can't be sold and repurposed just because land titles aren't clear. And then, of course, there's a lot of work that's been done, especially in Odisha and others, giving um, uh, slum dwellers um, access to land titles. But that's that's a whole other, uh, a whole other set of things. You know, the one one scam in this city, especially Mumbai, is the whole SRA. I mean, I'm. I'm telling you, that is just a can of worms. If you open that, and let me tell you, it is the most secular exercise ever. Everybody is involved in it. All religion, all political parties, all ethnicities, all castes, everything. Everyone is involved in that scam. It is the most consistent scam I have studied in my life. It is called SRA in this city of Mumbai. All right, Ruben. Property rates in tier three cities like Mysore are skyrocketing. I have to ask this to you because of NRIs buying plots as investments. It's bizarre to see empty plots area after area with no built houses. Should this be taxed separately, Ruben? What are you NRIs doing? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this NRI doesn't own anything. So, <laughs> so, so there, there's no point blaming it on me, but Look again, I, I, you know, this stuff is just to me is just fascinating. I, I, I frankly don't understand why you would buy. Uh, you know, again, it's it's this is this sense that you have in your head that there are these insane returns that you can get uh, to to pro property and so on and so forth without it's no, it's completely uncorrelated with the macro environment, completely uncorrelated with everything else. I mean, you know, you could just as easily have been buying Netflix stock. Right. I mean, it's yeah. gone up 65,000 percent since IPO. So it, it's, you know, so why people have this attachment to real estate? I don't get it. But look, it's it's emotional. It's a, it's all of those things. I mean, should you be applying taxation and so on? I mean, if you're an NRI, I don't know. But, you know, I mean, the flip side of it is you've seen what Singapore has done with uh, with uh, with non PR non citizens, which is if if things get bad enough and become enough of a political problem you you impose a high stamp duty of as high as 65% and hopefully that dissuades buyers but you know in general i mean singapore also has the constraint of actual constraint of land yeah. there isn't any land outside of that island so i mean given that mysore doesn't have those kind of issues my instinct would be to not tinker, not over-regulate, all of those things. Because once you let the state in into these sort of things, it you know it goes wrong very quickly. I can't necessarily tell you how it will go wrong, but it's very likely it will. And, and I was just going to add so to Ruben's point. Right? So exactly. So Singapore is constrained for land. We are not constrained for land. We have artificially constrained the formal housing market. Exactly. Right? Which is why. And there is asymmetric information. I know what's going to be built. I know what roads. And so, so for you know, for the average person, you watch people with access to information get really rich, right? And and that perpetuates a this thing of oh, if only I knew that information, right? Then I'd get rich as well. And you understand it. I mean, you understand that sentiment. But we because we have stifled the house, the formal market, not just for housing, but many other things in so many different ways. We've now created an artificial scarcity, where there are outsized returns to be made, where there are returns to asymmetric information. Um, you know, and 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 actually a simpler solution is just to 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 liberalize the uh, market for housing. It's not just uh, mm -hmm. Mysore. You can go to Punjab, the GT Road, uh, the famous uh, GT Road Highway. You will have uh, NRIs from Canada and UK. That's how we, you know, Punjabis call mm -hmm. it. Canada and UK and they keep buying these highway properties. I don't know what's with them and highway properties but they like highway properties and they keep on buying them and for no damn reason the rates are like skyrocketing over there. It, it literally makes no sense. So I, I can actually understand. Another interesting question. Uh, organic dense cities like uh, in, in India like Varanasi and uh, Bangalore are already congested um so what uh, is uh, the actual solution to that so someone ruben has asked is eminent domain the answer uh again um not necessarily i mean look again it it 
it it you've got to separate out in all of these cases what is being caused by the supply constraint right so this congestion that we described for instance in mumbai for instance it, when you have only 12% of the land available for public use you will get congestion but that doesn't have to be the way things are there is actually another way to do things so rather than basically you know this is where i i worry a lot about the fact that we are going too much after the symptoms of the disease rather than trying to diagnose what is the disease and trying to get back to curing the disease rather than curing the symptom and everything that is being described here is a symptom of a larger disease which is at the back end and those supply side constraints if you don't solve for those yes you will solve for something here and it'll show up somewhere else you don't actually fundamentally uh, change anything if you don't actually tackle the supply side issue at its source so to speak so i think a lot of these are kind of upstream issues they're plumbing issues they're policy related issues they're not you are seeing the manifestations of those problems as congestion expensive housing things like that all right so one more question urban land seeding act destroyed urban planning i mean do you think it destroyed that is the first half or uh, and the next is i don't know what this law is can you highlight three laws similar to ucla that you would love to see scrapped so pritika can go for it so i think ultra was implemented at a time where so you know ultra made it hard to do large sort of acquire large parcels of land and do large township development right which may have been relevant at a time where income inequality was also so much there were very few people that could acquire such large parcels of land right and um so i don't know that it made planning harder um but you know i mean the, the, you know, and, and and you know whoever needed to violate it certainly violated it um what needs to be scrapped uh, quite a few things um restrictive zoning right we need much much less restrictive zoning much more mixed use zoning certainly fsi fai there's a lot of work yet to be done on rental housing so there's a draft rental housing uh, uh, you know bill which is great it takes into account the distortions we were talking about earlier which is that low cost rental housing doesn't need to be classified as hotels but there's actually a lot of clauses within you know within that work that really need to be uh, really need to be implemented yeah but but again all of these require us to go back to source and ask okay what is it that's actually clogging the pipe and then start from there rather than focus on a symptom and say what is the symptom that clogs up this particular problem and let's get rid of it fair enough fair enough all right so before we wrap it up uh, first pratika you and then ruben so any last closing words uh, first of all this is not going to be the last podcast so this is just one of the many times i'm going to call you guys as in when i read something you guys have written and the reports you write i uh, on one of the rare podcasters who actually reads reports generated by <laughs> organizations like you uh, so there are matlab mere jaise log hai we exist and we like to talk about these things so pritika uh, so maybe you can have some uh, few words and then i'll go to ruben um so sure. no this this has been an absolute pleasure we we love talking about cities and we've done it for you know enough years that clearly you know we, we we really care about it i think look i think the answer to a lot of the problems we're going to tackle with like i said whether it's growth or it's climate climate change runs through cities these aren't going to be easy problems right it's it's what ruben said earlier about you know that because it's so hard there's a temptation just to do the quick fixes to look at the symptoms of the underlying causes also keep in mind this has not happened at a at a at certainly at a speed and then a scale you know so other developing countries may may urbanize at this um at this pace uh, but not at the scale of our population and so these are hard challenges and i'd say the more people that work in this space um the more important and and the one thing that i always say i think to study planning and to understand cities you have to understand economics and you have to understand markets just the basics of it because you know that's 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 where cities come from um and so my pet peeve is you know every planning program should have a found, strong foundation in economics um ruben yeah so i'm not sure 
what to add other than to say, look, every aspiration that the country has ultimately depends on getting urban right. Whether it's your $10 trillion economy or a $20 trillion economy, all of that depends on getting urban right. As far as I can see, certainly there's been no uh, example anywhere in the world of people having had left cities uh, back to villages and creating economic growth out of that. So this is a non-negotiable in that sense. You have to get it right. The problem is you have a very narrow window to get it right, right? The, the, the problem with urban and especially the infrastructure side of it is that if you make a mistake in health policy or education policy, you can quickly reverse it. But if you get the Delhi Metro wrong, you are stuck with it for the next 75 years. It's very, very difficult to undo mistakes that you make in the urban space, which is why I go back to basically saying, don't have these like, you know, these knee jerk responses to immediate problems that you face. Take a very systematic and systemic view of urban because these are systems level issues. Cities are nothing but systems integrators, right? It is where a lot of the stuff plays out. So therefore, knee jerk solutions are not a good idea at all. Be as thoughtful as possible. And the kind of last bit of this, which I think is intuitive, is a lot of, certainly within the practice and within our community, this is not like technology, right? I mean, most of what needs to be done, we've known how to do it and we've known how to do it for decades, right? Uh, we've known how to do street grids. As I said, whether it's uh, Mohenjo-daro or Jaipur under Raja Man Singh, they had grids in place. So this is not like we've devised some new technology that we need to uh, impress upon people and so on. So at some level, I suppose the, you know, the community that is interested in this also have to ask the question of why isn't anyone listening? Right? And I think that's an incredibly important piece of this uh, in, in addition to understanding the fact that cities are job markets. And so therefore understanding how markets function is has to be a critical part of planning, has to be a critical part of any education that people go through who in people who are interested in, in cities and so on and so forth. But ultimately, it is my very strong belief that unless you create a political constituency, you will not have any of the outcomes that you desire because at every step of the way, the instinct in the human mind is either magic bullet or run back to the villages and all your problems go away. Right. True. So we have to create that political constituency. And so that's the, you know, that's where really podcasts like yours really help Kushal because, you know, getting the word out you know, I, I wouldn't call it conversion therapy, but like, you know, getting more people on board, the idea that this stuff matters and all the other dreams you have depend on this particular thing to actually play out well. I couldn't agree more. And which is why I was so, so much looking forward to this chat with both of you is, you know, there is a, there's a culture of mediocrity that is peddled in our society, especially in my my in my mind, societies that fail come up with excuses to justify their failures. Um, you know, there's a famous line in a song written by an old Aussie rock band, Silverchair. You know, they say, "You say money isn't everything. Well, I like to see you live without it." Was the line, and uh, this is all, you know, your typical uncle saying, Beta paisa hato ka mail hai. real life is being satisfied. Look, I'm not stopping you from being satisfied. But this fetishization of poverty, this this romanticism of uh, urban, uh, the rural life, I mean, I don't, I have never gotten it. Societies that fetishize all the wrong things do not progress. They do not progress socially. They do not progress economically. I think a lot of India's problems stem from the lack of of this aspiration to become urbanized. And, and I, I, when I started reading all the literature that you guys sent, look, I did not know these things beyond the larger, like I'm a believer in the, the, the strength of the free markets. And when I started, you know, I'm so grateful to you sending me those emails with all the written material, which I actually went through. And I realized that literally the story of India for the next few years has to be... Uh, 
uh, the story of uh, urbanization. And if we don't urbanize, if we don't industrialize, we may skip a lot of uh, these buses. And uh, and I've you know, and I wish people realize what is at stake. We climate change is an issue, but once again catastrophism is not going to get us anywhere. I, I, I see people giving these doomsday scenarios and unfortunately the nature of social media is as a person like me who's a content creator, this is something that I face a lot. I'll give you an example. Today's podcast could have been called India's urban landscapes are terrible. I could have gotten more views that way. But that was not the intent of the podcast. Mm -hmm. The intent of the podcast was how do we reform India? We have a problem. But it, it, in such a, it, it is it is so hard to fight against these forces. So once again, Ruben, Pritika, thank you very much for coming. And I wish you guys all the best. And uh, this is an open invitation from the Charvak podcast. Whenever a new piece of research or a report comes, please share it with me. I'll be more than happy to promote it on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Kushal. And thank you to all your listeners and viewers. So all right. Yes. All right, guys, we'll wrap it up. Uh, before I wrap it up, please, if you want to follow uh, Pritika and Ruben in the description of the podcast, I have left their Twitter handles. You can also follow Arthur uh, Global on Twitter. You can also go and visit their website. When you go on their website, you will see reports and many other documents that they have shared on the website. I would urge all of you to read. Look, the one thing I take a lot of pride with when it comes to the Charvak podcast is the the. And I have nothing against kids. Uh, before somebody says, "Kyo bachcho ki mar nahi mar bhai, nahi mar um, But uh, the giant listener viewer base of this podcast is actually twenty five to sixty five years old. Literally, this is the demographic that matters because this is the demographic that is in the marketplace that is going out there. So you guys should go and read these kinds of things. That's why I experiment with these subjects. Otherwise, I could have, you know, literally done Billy Rasta Kaat Gai, Kuta Kaat Gaya kind of a discussion and garnered a lot of views. But I don't is because I want you, the viewers and the listeners to be educated about this. So please keep supporting me in these endeavors. Like this video, leave your comments. You can also ask, maybe if you have any follow-up questions, you can ask them to Pritika and Ruben on social media. I, I think they'll be more than happy to engage with them. And if you want to support this podcast, please become a member. You can become a member on YouTube, Patreon, wherever you are, fan more, buy the merch or send your donations to UPI. I'll see you guys next time. Until then, namaste, take care. Bye.